Hello photography friends, Eugene Negovieski with M Photo Studios here, excited to bring to you an incredible interview. We are privileged to introduce to you Anna Brandt, all the way from Southern California. Anna Brandt, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us today. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's raining in California, but I'm loving the rain and I'm just trying to stay positive and motivated. Wonderful. Now, Anna Brandt certainly doesn't need much of an introduction, but for those of you who might not know who she is, she only happens to be the premier maternity and newborn photographer in the world. She has photographed celebrities left and right, and she is so experienced. So we are so privileged and honored to have her here with us today. We're just going to jump right into it. What do you say, Anna? You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. And I'm going to come back to the beginning for a second again. You've been at this for a long time and you have so much experience, but tell us how it is that you got started with photography. Oh gosh, I don't know if we have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Every time someone asks me and my husband rolls his eyes like, oh, we're going to be here a while. You know, I was, <laughs> um, I was a hobbyist for 10 years straight, like 19 to 29. I was a hobbyist. I did not right. have any intentions of going pro. I loved photography. Anyone who knows my story, I'm an adopted child and I don't have any photos of myself under five. And so that was always my motivating factor for just capturing my own life. Um, but purely as a hobbyist, um, I went to school, I ended up becoming a web designer and had a website at 23 years of age for my photography, but still hadn't planned on being a professional. Uh, I became mm. Aunt Anna, very young, my brothers. I'm the youngest of five. And I think my first baby that I ever photographed, my nephew Joshua, gosh, I think he's like almost 30 now, he's late 20s. I, I can't even, I, my nieces, they're married. I just, I can't even conceive of it. But when my nieces and nephews came into the family, I was very fascinated by the relationship between my grandfather, uh, my dad, and my brother, and the grandchild. It was, you know, four generations. And as an adopted child, I had never seen four generations. And I'll never yeah. forget my nephew sitting, you know, at six months in a diaper and all for, you know, all my, my brother and um, the three, the th other three generations, my brother, my dad, and my grandfather, you know, being at a family barbecue and just looking at that and wanting to grab my camera and, and capture images. I was very, very in love with the early stages, watching my sister-in-laws mm. get pregnant and my sister and was always drawn to maternity and newborn even before I knew what it was. And, mm. you know, basically the story goes at 29, I was a web project manager and one day I just quit my job and never looked back. I didn't have a plan. I had a website and that was it. And I, I literally just quit. Gave notice to my boss. I think I cried for three days and just began my career. I was newly married. I had moved from New York to California. My husband was out of town when I quit. And I called him and said I quit my job and grabbed my camera and went to the beach. And the rest is history. Wow. And so almost at the same time as you started to appreciate, pick up the camera and appreciate photography is when you also knew you wanted to do maternity and, and the newborn genre specifically. Again, you didn't really know that, but later on you realized that there is a place for that and that's what you've always wanted to be doing. I started it pretty immediately, not really knowing what it was. I had actually mm -hmm. followed Ann Geddes' work since I was like yeah. 17. So I had mm -hmm. every book, every calendar. The two photographers that I followed were Ansel Adams and Ann Geddes. And I still have mm -hmm. all the books from both of them. I remember having Ansel Adams screensavers, Ann Geddes calendars. I was obsessed with the black and white portrait and the dark room and the, the shades of gray mm -hmm. and blacks and whites. I was very obsessed with that from Ansel. From Ann, it was just, her motherhood, her, her motherhood work, her maternity, mm. her classic mm. newborn. I wasn't so much into the prop stuff that she did, but her classic work I was drawn oh. to. So when I started, fortunately, my husband who had lived in California, his friends were all getting pregnant and having babies. He was the last of his friends to get married. So when we mm. moved from the East to the West, 
one of his dear friends was pregnant within the, she was pregnant before I was pregnant, within the first year of us being here. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I need to photograph you. And I'll never forget it because she's very, very fair skinned from Idaho very mm. pale with red hair and her husband is a black man very very dark skin he's a firefighter this big black guy gorgeous she's this teeny tiny white woman and i remember going on yahoo discussion boards photo saying photographing a black man with a white woman how to pho uh, photograph interracial couples because there was no google there wasn't Creative right. Live. There wasn't all of the tons of videos there are now. I was terrified. And I, I remember photographers telling me, exposed for the darker skin, you know, put his skin by the light. And I was like, well, I don't have any light. Okay. And, we're, and I photographed them in their home and I had put him by the door and to allow the light to come through him and put her in front of him. I, I did a portrait of them in bed with using the, the window in the house and they still have their their daughter, I think, is tw just turned 20. So I've been a pro 20 years this June and her daughter just turned 20. And their pregnant photos from this daughter are still on her wall. And so I I just am amazed because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, my first newborn, I had went to a beauty supply store. This is a true story bought a box of cotton. I still don't know why to this day that the cotton you wrap around the hair to dye your hair, mm. it came in a box this big and you pull out the piece of cotton and it keeps going. I filled a laundry basket, an oval laundry basket that I had gotten from a craft store, filled it with cotton and my first newborn was in this basket of cotton. I'm sure I still have the photo somewhere to this day. And I thought it was like no. the most amazing thing in the world. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I <laughs> did, I did a ton of free sessions and I went to mm -hmm. my doctor and said, I had a new doctor. I wasn't even pregnant and said, can I put a sign next to your reception window that mm -hmm. said I would do free sessions for maternity and newborn and I'd give them an eight by 10 that I would print myself in a dark room. And she said, yes. I literally wrote it on eight and a half by 11 notebook paper and taped it to her reception window. And every time a client came to me, I would print an eight by 10 for them. I would print one for her. I'd go to Aaron Brothers, buy a frame, because I'd try to get buy one, get one 50% off, buy a frame go to the doctor's office and hang it on her wall one by one till I had an OB display. And then what I did was I started shooting child models for money. That was like my income while I was building my business. So I would shoot child models that many of them are actors and actresses and successful to this day that I did their headshots at six months, one year, two year. I specialized in under five. So I worked with child actors, I was paid $125. I would sit down, create their Z cards, and I would try to turn those model clients into family clients by sitting down and going over the pictures with them, producing their eight by tens, but also taking candid photos that the mom would want to hang in her wall. So I do like, I was known for my eyelash shots. I'd get a child of the model looking down and it'd be like an eyelash shot. And I remember mm -hmm. selling like a 16 by 20 of this eyelash shot from a headshot session because I was like, for every time someone's in front of my camera, even if they're a child model and mom only needs a Z card or an eight by 10 for the agent, I'm going to shoot 150 more pictures that I would from a child portraiture standpoint, sit down with them, go over pictures, try to sell them those photos. And that's how I built my client base. Wow. <laughs> That's that's a fantastic story, and you you touched upon it certainly um, in your story there. But just to kind of make it clear to some people, because Anna Brand, you are at the the top of the light. You are who people look up to and hope to become with their photography studio when they get started. So, what are some things that you can say to people who are just starting out or maybe kind of in the middle, looking to make that next step up? Uh, like, what was it for you like going from the beginning to where you are now? Again, you touched on it a lot in your story, but 
was it just really kind of a matter at that beginning of just, you know, acting as if you knew what you were doing and just taking the chances, even if maybe you didn't really know what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. I had no idea what I was doing for like five years. I mean, oh. I remember when I had my third child, I was like, oh, I finally think I understand newborns. And I was mm. six years into my career. I mean, the I think it's the art of the hustle. I think that mm. when I started, I said, I quit my job. I remember my boss going, wait, why are you quitting? You're like our top web project manager. I was, I had taken courses to become certified with Microsoft. I was hand coding. I was, I was at a really good point in my career and I was making really good money. And I felt bad for my boss because he's like, but wait, Anna, like we like having you around. I'm like, I like this too, but I, I want to pursue photography. And I didn't even really know what that meant. I had a used camera from eBay. I didn't own any lights. I didn't own a diffuser, a reflector, a five in one. I owned nothing. I had a used camera from eBay. I had an enlarger in our spare bedroom that my husband gifted me for Christmas. And I made a dark room in our spare bedroom. And we joke all the time that my son, who now does vid video and travels the world, I was pregnant with him in chemicals in the dark room and not even knowing it. So whenever he hears the story, he always says, oh, that's why. He has such a love for photography and videos because I was breathing in darkroom chemicals pregnant. I had no idea I was even pregnant. But when I started day one, I had a fee. I, even though I did free sessions for friends and family, which I still do, I've never charged friends and family to this day. Um, I had a fee from day one. I had a website day one. My dad's an accountant. I went to school for accounting. I had a business checking account day one. I had insurance day one. I had kind of the infrastructure immediately. Things that people will not even do. They'll be shooting and then they'll be like, oh, should I get insurance? Or, oh, should I get a business checking account? Or everyone's calling my, my, my cell phone at one o'clock in the morning. Should I get a business line? It's, it's, you've got to build your infrastructure first. So, so I had been working for 10 years. I put myself through college, paid for my own apartment and, and cars. You know, I'm, I'm from two self-employed parents. My adopted parents have, have never worked for anybody else. And so my dad is a self uh, was a self-employed accountant his entire life till he was 80 years of age. He built two businesses. So I was raised in a family where so many things. When you learn, you teach. Uh, my mom has a master's in psychology, a master's in divinity. I've watched this woman who's 82 now spent her whole life teaching and providing a service to her community. So understand that it does have to do with kind of how you raised and you can change that. But my philosophy was the, the hustle, the art of the hustle, like, okay, I'm going to do this, but I got to make sure that if someone does pay me, even if it's $10, I have a checking account that that money can go into because my dad's doing my taxes and he's going to want to know where this money's coming from and going. And so from the beginning, I had a shell. Did I know what I was doing from a photography standpoint? Yes and no. I, I understood how to use my camera. Many, many, many date nights with my husband, him reading the camera manual to me. I remember crying to my professor because I felt like I couldn't understand aperture, f-stop, ISO. I just didn't, I didn't get it. I remember I failed the test twice because I just didn't get it. I was like, why is the hole smaller, the number bigger? I just didn't get it. And I, I literally thought, I'm never going to get this. I can't even pass the test. And, you know, one day, I remember the first time I used lights, I used hot lights that the dark, the mixed couple, my husband's friend, dad's a firefighter. I used hot lights in their house and almost burned their house down because he like smelled fire and their curtains were on fire in a firefighter's home. He's like, Anna, we love you, but could you not burn my house down? So there are so many mistakes I made along the way. I remember I had a Mamiya 645 medium format camera, another used camera. Something was broken and I couldn't take the slider out that's supposed to prevent you from taking pictures. And I did an entire day of mini sessions at a park for six hours. Couldn't wait. And I had sold all of these because I have a real price. And I remember a week later sitting on bed with my husband, a stack of film. I'm like, I can't wait to see these pictures. And one by one, everything's blank. And I start sobbing and I take my camera and they're like, 
the, something was broken in the mechanism and the, you left the slider in, and your camera shouldn't have taken pictures, but you did. And it was all gone. And I had to call every client crying. And there was a client I never got back because it was an extended family. And they're like, well, they're all gone. And we lost the session. And I had to refund the little money mm. I had been paid. And so I've made every mistake there is to make. But I think my mentality from day one is this is a business. Did I have any idea where my business was going? I, I had no idea. This was before YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. There was no social media. I had no prediction of the future. I, I wish I did. I probably would have did a few things differently. It was spending every day and night at Barnes and Nobles, reading every book I could find, learning how to use my camera. So when I got in front of the client, I didn't look like an idiot trying to change my shutter ISO and aperture. I wanted to get to a point where I could just show up to a shoot and change the settings on my camera without going, how do I do this? I looked very young for my age. So people would always, I'd show up and they'd be like, oh, is the photographer coming? And I, I wore overalls and my hair was in a high ponytail. And I was like, yeah, I'm it. And they'd be like, oh, and I mean, you name the scenario, I've, I've had it. But I just kept saying, I love photography. This is what I wanna do. Every time I made a mistake, I would say, okay, I made a mistake. Let me not do that again. Every time I screwed up to a client, I would apologize to them, try to make it right. And I spent many years, I still have days where I cry and be like, oh my gosh, that was just like the worst day ever. But I think that if you're in this, if this is really what you want to do, if you say, gosh, I really love photography and I, I want to do this for as long as I live, that means you're all in. Treat it like a business, treat it with respect, have the knowledge that you need, put your ego aside because we all need to learn things. And this is a service business. It's, it should not be an ego driven business. We're a service business, meaning if a client is paying you for a service, you need to provide that service. So if you take the ego out of the equation and come from a service level mind, I think you'll have a successful business. I mean, I'm doing this a solid 20 years while having three children along the way. And I say all the time, there's days I'm a good mother, lousy wife. Days I'm a good wife, lousy photographer. Days I'm a good photographer, a lousy mother. But I teach my children that when we don't know something, we learn how to do it. When we make a mistake or something's broken, we fix it. That we acknowledge our mistakes, but also treat our lives with, with the respect you should get paid for your work. So doing free sessions for five years isn't, isn't going to give you any respect. You need to be charged for your time. And you can still do free sessions and you can still do model calls and you can still donate your time to charity. But if this is going to be a business and if this is something that you want to do, then you kind of have to go through the business checklist and do all the things that you were supposed to be doing. I mean, even in the situation we're in, people are discovering, oh, I never paid myself. I never got a paycheck. Now I can't get unemployment. Or shoot, I never did things legally and they're wanting tax returns and, and I can't apply for a loan because I don't have tax returns. And now, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who didn't run their business the way they were supposed to be running it. And now, unfortunately, they're feeling that effect. If you run things the way they're supposed to be done and try to kind of be a law binding citizen and take care of that infrastructure, then the creative process, the learning process, the giving yourself permission to grow, I feel like I feel like, and I know I'm rambling on and on and on, but I have to get these thoughts out of my brain, but I feel like people don't give their per self permission to grow. I mean, when I started, I was 29 years of age. I'm 49 now. I'm completely different when I was 29. I'm completely different when I was 35. Sometimes I feel like I'm 16 all over again. I... I know I look younger than my age. That's definitely helped me in my career. But I also know that 20 years flew by and I still have so much I want to do. I mean, I, I had dinner with Ann Geddes in her home in New York this past um, winter. And I was looking at her who she has, I think, another 20 years on top of me. And she still is alive and passionate and growing and working. And I was sitting with her going, 
I still have so much more I want to do. I'm not even halfway through my career. That's how I feel. So I feel like everybody just needs to take a break and breathe and give yourself permission to grow. Photography is not going anywhere. You could be 90 years old and if you're in good health, still doing photography. You could be doing this as long as you allow yourself to live a healthy life. And don't be so impatient to get that award or to beat the person next to you or to have more likes than your neighbor or have more Instagram follows. Forget all of that and just focus on your journey and allow yourself to grow and mature in your process. And if you do that, I think you'll take away the expectation that others have of you. Success should be about how you feel and about your personal milestones, not what other people are expecting of you. And just give yourself permission to grow and evolve, and you will. I think I said that all in one sentence. (laughs) No, but Anna, your your answer was great. It was inspirational. I think it was relatable for a lot of the the viewers, especially when you were talking about some of the bad moments that you experienced. And, you know, it's also, you know, again, very inspirational for people to hear of what they can do to continue to improve themselves. And uh, if it's not too late or if they're just starting something or, you know, it's never too late, as you say. And you touched on in your answer how you preach to your children and you were kind of raised in a way that if you don't know something to go learn it. So I want to come to you now because you are an educator and you are a mentor in this industry and you do know so much and you have so much valuable information to share to photographers. Where can our audience go to connect with you and to keep hearing some of these messages that you have for them to help themselves? So I teach online. You can go to bellybabyschool.com and I have over 50 courses there and I teach online around the world. It's log log on demand. You can sign up and learn immediately. I have tons of information there. I do have in-person workshops at workshops.annabrent.com and all of these links are on my main website, annabrent.com. So if you get lost, you can find your way around. I do have a Facebook group with over 28,000 photographers on Facebook where we're constantly helping and educating people there. And of course, I have a YouTube channel, AnnaBrantVideos.com. And we have tons and tons of video there as well. I have a podcast on iTunes. If you just Google Anna Brandt, you'll probably start going down this whole rabbit tunnel of information because I, I do have a lot of information because it's been 20 years, only stopping to have three children. I mean, so, and I've made every mistake there is. I can't, oh gosh, the mistakes I could, I could spend all day talking about my mistakes. So I feel like if I can help people maybe not make as many mistakes or maybe try to be inspired um, that I can continue doing it and hopefully help somebody else. We will be sure to put links to Anna's uh, you know, website and all these things that she mentioned in the description below. So it'll be easy for all our viewers to find and to follow. Uh, I'm sure many of them will want to be you know, connecting with you uh, in the future and going forward, Anna. Thank you for that wonderful advice. Okay, I'm going to jump kind of to the present day now, Anna, with you. And I know that you offer uh, print products uh, through your brand and in your studio. And why is it that you do this? And kind of what is your reason to print? Okay, well, I think for me, when I started, it was film. And so products were super important because nobody was doing anything on their own. They would have to go to professional photographers for prints, books, canvas, and things like that. And I have a lot of longtime clients. I have some clients that have been coming to me for, gosh, I think my oldest client is that still comes to me has been 19 years. So because her son is first year in college. And so um, I do have clients that have been coming to me for a very long time. But even for new clients that have entered in the digital world, um, there's so many reasons. For one, books. I've always been able to sell books because I tell clients that it's not necessarily for you at this moment it's for your children and the generation that is coming up behind because what are we doing we're visual historians and we are capturing people's lives i tell photographers all the time in my workshops that you could be photographing the next president of the united states how do you know so that's why i'm completely against deleting images or, or getting rid of things um, because you just don't know whose life you're capturing i tell my clients that had i been given 
in a book of photos of myself as a newborn or with my biological mother, I can tell you, hands down, it would probably be one of the most important things in my life. I don't have that. So I tell clients all the time, books are so much fun for your kids to look back on. Even just this weekend, I've been cleaning out the garage and I've been working on a kind of a baby book template for photographers. So I pulled out my children's baby books. And for my son, I had bought Ann Gaddis the first five years, and that's what I used for his baby book. For my two daughters, I actually bought these books that were hand um, wired with ribbon, and I took the books apart, made my own sheets, like literally feeded the paper through my printer, made my own headings, made my own baby book, wound it back together with ribbon, and those are my daughter's baby books. So I had taken them out of the garage this weekend, and they were so excited. They stopped their homework, and they were looking at what I wrote about them. They were looking at their photos, and they were like, oh my gosh, my 17-year-old was literally like this taking nonstop pictures of her baby book, posting them on Snapchat, saving them, sending them to her friends. She was so in love with her book. And I tell my clients, kids want this. We want to look back. We don't remember what we were like as a newborn or six month or when we have no idea. And so you're capturing these images. Why not put them in a book? You may realize that it's a little expensive now, but so is the car you're driving that's going to be gone in a few years. I mean, or, you know, the house you're living in or the TV that's going to break. I mean, these books, this is your life. This is history. As far as hanging pictures on the wall, you know, to me, it's what makes a house a home. You know, my husband is from a divorced family and did not grow up with pictures on the wall, but I'm not from a divorced family and we didn't hang pictures on the wall either, but we took a lot of photos in the home because my adopted father is from Argentina and he's the only family member that lives in the States. So being raised in this family, pictures were a big part of our life and we would always send them back to the family in South America. So I was fortunate enough to be raised in a family that believed in prints, but still in our home, we were in a, we have a big home in upstate New York that my mom had wallpaper on. I don't think they've, uh, they ever hung a picture on the wall in their home. And to this day, if I think about my parents' home, all the ones they have, I give them a lot of chromas or easel backed frames. I think they're all on something. I'm trying to think if there's anything even on the wall in my parents' house, but they loved things that were printed. And so in my home, I immediately, when I had children, started hanging photos. And at first, my husband was like, hmm, do you really want to hang that many photos on the wall? Then I'll never forget, we had our home for 10 years. We sold the home. So we have three little ones. And when our house went on the market, the realtor, my husband says, you're not going to like this, but the realtor wants you to take all the photos off the wall. Now, by this time, I've got three little ones. I had a mural. I had a fabric mural done. That's huge. It's huge. So you would go in our house. It, this thing was probably like, I don't even know, maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. I mean, huge. One of those tapestries of the children that hung in our wall. And if you went through our home, I probably had maybe conservatively at least 30, probably 30 to, I'd say 30 to 40 pictures in my home. Every, every kid had canvases. We had painted murals. We had family photos. Not overdone. I think tastefully done. My husband says the realtor wants them all down. I was like, over my dead body. I'm not taking one photo down. The realtor's like, well, we, do you want to sell your home? I'm like, I really don't even care if we sell our home. I'm not taking anything down. This is a huge conversation. You know how realtors are. So she was having a showing and we had to leave the house with three little ones. And my husband's like, you didn't take anything down. I go, and I'm not taking anything down. So the realtor's like, fine, I'm going to show your house, but don't expect to get any offers with the photos hung on the wall. I go, fine. Because at this point, I didn't even care if I sold the house anyway. After a while, I was like, well, I kind of like our house. So, uh... I'll never forget the next day she calls and I think she's going to yell at me. And she goes, um, I have a question for you. And I was like, sure. And she goes, she pauses and she's like, I need your business cards. And I was like, oh, why do you need my business card? She's like, because every single person that came into the home wanted to know who the photographer was of all of the pictures that were in the home. And I was like, oh, really? And to this day, I'd laugh about it because when you'd walk into the home for the showing, there would be her business cards 
and my business cards. And people, she said people were taking photos of the home, getting ideas of how to hang photos in their home. And it's funny because we ended up taking our house off the market because I was like, I don't want to sell anymore. And then we got a full price <laughs> offer and we ended up selling the home. And I know it was because <laughs> of those photos. And the story even continues because when we moved, I took a while to hang the photos because I it was a different home. I needed a clean palette. I needed to figure out what I was going to print new. After about three months, my husband's like, I got to talk to you. And I was like, what's up? He's like, you got to hang something. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I can't stand it. I you need to hang a photo. I feel like we're in a museum. Like you need to hang a picture. I was like, you were like against photos when we got married 10 years ago. And he's like, yeah, it's driving me crazy. Like just hang a picture. And it's funny because this home we've been in now, we've only been in two years and I have a lot of photos hung, but not as much as I normally do. And probably several times in my home, the kids are like, well, mom, you haven't, you haven't really hung that many photos. And I'm like, I go around the house and I'll count. And I'm like, we actually have a really good amount of photos. And I'm like, yeah, but you haven't really, like there's this whole bare wall that you never decorated. And I was like, well, I'm trying to figure out what to do with that wall. And so I, I'm always telling my clients this, that my own family that I kind of had to sell on the idea of hanging work. If I were to go home right now and take off all the pictures on our wall, my kids would probably lose their mind. They would go, what's happening? What's ha like they, it, it, it makes children feel amazing when you hang images of themselves on the wall. That means you're proud of them. You love them with the crooked teeth and the missing teeth and the funky hairstyles. Every year I switch out the portraits of my children. We've had braces, missing front teeth, crooked hair, you name it. And it still goes up on the wall because that's who they are. And then it builds self-esteem for the children. And there was, um, and I know I'm rambling again, but there, there was a thing where my youngest daughter in school, they said, how do you know your mother loves you? I think she was in second grade and she brought home this paper and she said, because my mom wears a necklace of me every day. And I've been my gift every, because we have a Mother's Day shoot every May and we've been doing that for 10 years. And so we do the shoot for Mother's Day. So it's coming up. We'll probably do it on our front porch every Mother's Day. And then I spend the next six months creating a necklace. I buy jewelry for the in-laws. I buy a canvas for the wall. I replace our work at the studio. That's kind of my gift to myself. And my kids know that that necklace means more than anything to me because it's their image. And so I'm always telling my clients these stories during IPS. I'm always like, if they're like, well, I don't know if I should. And I go, what do you mean you don't know? You pregnant? Are you with a newborn? This is what people want to see when they enter your home. They want to see these images. And I started creating wall guides during this time and posting them on social media. My clients are like, oh my gosh, I love these room samples and these things that you're showing us. And I just had a client email me last week. Can we work on my book, my baby's book now that I have time and I'm home? This is such a good time to hang those photos on the wall and make kind of your house a home. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yes, you did. And you made me want to get more pictures of my family printed and put them up on my walls. <laughs> Honest to God, uh, there is really uh, so much that can be taken from what you were saying as well, too. Um, again, I, I like what you were saying about the house, that your house and how so important that it is for professional photographers, especially if they want to be selling print to be displaying it. Yes. In, not only displaying it in their studio, but to try to display it in a way that's going to emulate the home that they're trying to sell the client to. It's such an effective method. The more relatable that experience can be for their clients, the more beneficial it's going to be for the photographer. Yeah. And the fact that people change their minds. Like you, you were using your husband as an example. People can change their minds. Maybe today they don't want the prints, but tomorrow they're going to wake up and say, man, I really, really wish we had some printed photos right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is fantastic. Um, you definitely, you definitely uh, answered the question. Um, well, can I, I also say something? Sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. I did a podcast. It's on iTunes. You can hear it on iTunes. But I did a podcast saying, are you living the life? Meaning, are you being a fraud? And I, I almost mm. hated even using the word fraud because I didn't want to offend mm. anybody. But mm. I basically, my podcast was saying that we're visual photographers. We're visual people, right? We're creatives. We're historians. Mm. We say, oh, print your photos, hang your photos. So my, my podcast was saying, if I went to your home and you're a photographer, 
Would I be happy with what I saw? Would I see recent photos on the wall? If I went to your mm -hmm. website, would I see a recent headshot? Did you dye your hair, mm -hmm. cut your hair? Mm -hmm. Have you updated your headshot? I cut eight inches off my hair. I changed my headshot immediately within a couple of days because my clients are mm -hmm. used to seeing my hair in a ponytail and long hair. The minute I cut off my hair, I literally did a headshot that my daughter did a couple of days later and then my staff did some headshots as well. You've got to mm -hmm. live the life you're selling it's like and in this podcast i used an example of this eyelash lady i went to and my kids heard this podcast and they were laughing so hard because they remember the day that i went to go do eyelash extension and i was like oh i travel so much i'm going to try this whole eyelash extension thing and i go to this eyelash bar it's a thing now where you can go every month and pay this membership and get these eyelash extensions and when i get there my technician her eyelashes are falling off and I'm looking at her, they're literally half gone. And I'm like, anxiety to the roof. In my mind thinking, why do I want her to do my eyelashes when she doesn't even have all her eyelashes on? I went through it two hours and two hours of me laying on a table is very difficult to do. Two hours of me laying on a table, not moving. I was trying to listen to a podcast and the, the ear of things kept popping out of my ears. It was the worst two hours of my life. Make matters worse. She does them, they look good. What happens 48 hours later, they start falling out. Within four days, my eyes look like hers. I'm freaking out. I'm like, this is exactly why I didn't want to go to her. She doesn't even have any eyelashes. I called the bar, I'm upset. They go, come in, we'll do another set for free. I go in, I'm looking at the, I go, give me a different technician. The technician that walks in, she's cute, she's adorable. She's got all her eyelashes. I'm like, oh, she's gonna be great. I'm gonna have the best two hours. We're talking, we're having conversation. I leave with the beautiful eyelashes that lasted two weeks. And then I had to travel and leave the country and I decided this is not gonna work for me because I can't keep going. But the point of the story was I started going home thinking, we're photographers and if we don't have updated headshots and we don't have recent photos of our children and if we're not in the photos because we've gained 10, 20 pounds, we don't like the way we look, we don't like our hair color, we have wrinkles, how are we gonna sell their service to our clients? They're looking at you, they're going to your website, they're looking at your social media. If you have a home studio, they're coming into your home. And if you're the makeup lady selling makeup and you're not wearing any, why would I buy makeup from you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I want I have two things I want to say in in response to those points. They're all extremely valid. And that is to, again, not only to live the life that you are um, a professional of, but it can also help professional photographers to put themselves in the position of the client so that yes. they can better understand what they're going to be going through. Yeah. You know, when you have to think about, okay, what product should I use to print this? Or where should I put this in my house? Or how many should I get? Like that's putting yourself in your client's okay. shoes, which is only going to help you in, in your business uh, going forward. And that's the second thing that I want to take it one step further. Like, are you living a lie as a professional photographer? And we're going to touch on this a little bit in, in later in the interview too is, and that is if you are a professional photographer and you're interested in selling print products, you need to post pictures of them on yes. your, on your social media, on yeah. your websites. I know that you do that, Anna, and I want to address yeah. that a little later in the interview. Uh, but you can't expect to sell print products if you never show them off to your clients, exactly. whether you have a studio, whether it's in a studio or not, or if you don't have a studio or not, even you should still have them on social media. You should still have them on, on your website and you should be updating products, pictures of your products and pictures of your pictures in your products almost as often as you do pictures of your own, you know, your own pictures. Correct. Um, Cause if that's what you expect to sell, then you have to show it. You Correct. have to show it. Um, so yes, I loved that anecdote that you have, Anna. Um, it was wonderful, and I believe that it can be something that can be that can be very uh, helpful for photographers to kind of have that 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 thought again and, and put themselves in that in that position. Yeah. Um, and like you said too, especially with maternity and newborn photographers, you never know, as you said, you never know what that baby is going to turn out to be to become. Yeah. And even if it's nothing extravagant in, in in the grand scheme of things, it's of course it's extravagant for the the parents and for the the extended family of, of that child. So it's definitely something that everybody is going to want to make sure that they have uh, going forward. Yeah, and that you know that's one last thing too that I just want to mention quickly before we we go on, and and that is 
clients, you know, the clients of professional photographers are human. And we're talking about things that human, like human things that just all humans appreciate, whether you're a professional photographer, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, the president of the United States, or just, you know, somebody in the town, you appreciate these kind of things because it's a very human, spiritual, spiritual kind of thing. Um, but I want to also kind of jump then to the business side of print products as well. Uh, what is the benefit kind of from kind of a business end of having print products and offering them? Can they help a photographer maybe earn a little more or sustain a business a little bit longer, Anna? Yes, absolutely. I, you know, definitely you can make very good money off of prints and canvases and books and and any any physical product. I think that the markup can be, you know, very well and add to the growth and financial aspect of your business. But the other thing is by selling these products, clients are going to want to come back to you more because they're going to want to stay consistent in the things that they have. It's kind of like, um, if you have a, a like there's a jeweler across the street here in Tustin and so many times I remember when I first moved into Old Town my husband would always be like oh go to the jeweler across the street go to the jeweler across the street because he knows you and he can fix the jewelry and things like that and you want to establish a relationship with your clients and so I have so many clients that'll go hey can we do the same baby book that we did with my first child or my last child I did a baby announcement can we do the same with that you know I have a, a client who I've photographed all three of her children and each time she's framed her baptism outfit and I use a local framer for that. And so what's great is I can just, she says to me, just tell the framer to use the same frame as last time. And I've done three baby books with her. And so she said, can we do the same baby book that you did for Jacob and Catherine's book? Can you do the same amount of quotes for them? Can you do the same amount of things for them? Because I have three children and I want it to all be the same. And anyone that has more than one child, you know that if you don't have things the same, your children will call you on it. My kids do it all the time they'll be like oh well Evan got this and Olivia got this and 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 how come I don't have a picture of this size so I'm always I do everything times three in my life everything if I do one thing it's times three so any mother that has more than one child the first child they're gonna be like oh I have this new child and I if you can sell them on the book and hanging their work with the first child you, you're good now keep that relationship going so that they can come back to you with the second, give them an incentive, 20% off a returning album. Like we discount if they're buying more than one for the grandparents. And if they're your customer and they come back to you, they're going to want to do the same thing for child number two versus child number one. And I even have clients that'll go, gosh, we're on child number four and money is super tight. Can I make payments towards this album? And I'll be like, sure, we can do a payment plan because they're like, I have to have it. I have another client who during this break, she's like, I, she has just had her fourth daughter and she didn't do a baby book for one of the daughters. I think it's daughter number two did not get a book. And this client, we just did her home newborn session. So she emails me a couple days ago and she's, she, the home session was done like a month ago. So she hasn't even ordered pictures from child number four yet. She's like, Hey, child number two keeps asking where her baby book is. I was like, she's like, we never did one. And she's like, can you find the images? And I was like, yeah, we probably have them on our network. Did you buy the digital images for me? She's like, but we moved. And this is another thing is we think that buying the client, buying digital images is kind of the all end. Now this client is on my baby plan. So she's come from multiple sessions. We've done beach, we've done studio, we've done newborn, we've done milestones. Each time she buys the digital images, but that doesn't mean it's the end of it. So this particular client, I was like, did you buy the digital images? She's like, oh yeah, I bought the digital images. And and if you go to her home, she, because we did a home newborn session, I told Alex, video the walls, because she has photos all over the walls of, of that I've, some that I've printed, some that she's printed. She's the great, a great client. But of the four children, one doesn't have a book. And the child is, gosh, I think she's three. And because they're all home, 
The mom's like, it's killing me. Every day she's literally asking for her baby book. And so I was like, okay, let me go to the studio. I'll look through the network. I'll phone the photos. She's like, I have no idea where my digital images are. They're, we moved, they're in a box. I'm not gonna get them anytime soon. I was like, okay, she's like, can we please? She's like, uh, how fast can you do a baby book? It's driving me crazy. So I, I think it's, you know, any parent with a child, you can relate. When the child's like, oh, where's my tooth from the tooth fairy that you saved? And you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, like we were like, if you're a parent, you know that. And I started my business before I was a parent. And I think what helped me is because I started in the film world, I had no choice but to offer product. And I'll never forget my first frame sale was $750 out of a catalog. I'll never forget. We had, we had, uh, I was at a dining room table and I didn't have any samples none excel picture frames was the company at the time they would give photographers a wholesale book with no prices on it you know just like a a sample book there were no prices and i remember the night before my ordering appointment writing in pencil because i was afraid if i changed it i wouldn't be able to change it so i took the excel picture frame sample catalog i sat down with the wholesale price it was like my homework for the night i times everything times three this is 20 years ago, you guys, times every time times three and wrote the prices down in pencil. The client, it was a three month shoot. I did the ordering appointment in my home. She said, oh, we have a new home. I want frames. I said, okay. And I sold out of this catalog, held my breath, didn't say a word, learned the art of selling is don't say anything. Let the prices and the work speak for themselves. Just keep your mouth shut. And I was so nervous and it was over $750. I don't even remember how many things she bought, but I'll never forget that sale. I'll never forget the sale where I think it was $12,000 after I had my third child from a client that had four children and was decorating a playroom of canvases. And when I told her the total, I held my breath because I was afraid she was going to say something. And she looked at it and she's like, that's it. And I just was like, like holding my breath till like the money cleared my account. I wouldn't even order the canvases. Like I waited a week and left the money in my account because I was so afraid she would call and change her mind before I ordered the canvases. And then she sent an email going, just checking on ETA of the canvases. And I hadn't even ordered them yet because I was so stressed out. And so, you know, there's, there's, you can sell, you've got to learn the art of selling and learn not to trip over your words and, and negate yourself. Cause so many photographers will say, well, I can't afford a 30 by 40, or I can't afford, or I don't have the wall space because I live in a teeny tiny basement apartment. So I, I don't, I couldn't imagine, you know, having that on my walls. But you're not your client. And so you've got to sometimes just keep your mouth shut, listen to your client, offer and present to your client what's available, and then just sit down and be quiet and let them talk to you about what they need. Wonderful. And be sure to, again, follow through uh, Anna Brands on her channels and everything where you can get some more information on how to effectively sell or she will certainly find somebody to help you learn how to effectively sell to your clients in the art of selling. Yes. And you know what? Just as you said that, you just said mm -hmm. something. You said or have someone help you effectively. Whatever you just said. Mm -hmm. The art of selling. The mm -hmm. art of selling. <clears throat> If you're somebody that can't sell, there are people who can. You can mm -hmm. hire someone to do sales for you. I had an assistant for 10 years and she's very quiet, sweet girl. And I remember going, I think I need help in IPS. I just don't have time to do every ordering appointment myself. And she was like, okay, I'll do it. And she was very quiet and timid. I'm like, ooh, I don't know if this is gonna go well. And it actually worked really well because she wasn't me. So she was like, in the beginning, she was hesitant because she was young and she didn't have children and she didn't have a lot of money. And she was like, gosh, I would never be able to afford this. And I would always have to tell her, well, you're not my client. You're like, you know, 25 and you're just got married and you're not my client. And so mm. she's like, okay. So she kind of learned the art of selling and then I would hear her sometimes 
And because she wasn't me, she didn't have anything personally invested. Like I would be like, mm -hmm. why don't you choose that image? That's like the best image. And that image should be a 30 by 40. And the client would be like, no, I don't think so. And I'd be like all emotional. But Tiffany didn't have that emotion because so she was just like, facts like this is the price this is what you should do so if you don't understand the art of selling or you can't do it or you're just terrified or you're a terrible salesperson you can bring someone in that can do it and give them a commission i mean look at people who sell cars i could never sell a car ever mm. there are some fantastic people who all they do is sell cars and they make mm. a really good living selling cars you can right. bring someone in a salesperson in that can sell for you and gets mm. a commission and adjust your prices accordingly so that you can pay the commission and let them sell mm. for you you don't have to do it all you can delegate who says you yeah. have to do everything yourself Exactly, and on the flip side of your, your car salesman example, that hardly ever is the car salesman also the car engineer or the car mechanic or yeah. the you know, car planner. So like you say, you can specialize uh, and, and what do they call it? Kind of, maybe not outsourcing, but yeah, you know, pass on a specific job to somebody else. Yeah, why not? They'll probably make and you a you lot mentioned money. something about, or you mentioned how you can, uh, you know, if you, if you get clients with, more than one kid it's kind of a natural way to have them kind of all follow through you because everybody wants to have the same thing kind of a thing but then you also mentioned about the baby plan so for example just one child specifically can you can you just tell us a little bit more about your baby plan so if we just sorry focus on the one child sure, sure. what are some things that maternity and newborn photographers can do to kind of make i hate to say it this way but kind of make the most out of the one child even for sure i have had baby plans since my first retail studio and i was pregnant with olivia so i do everything by the birth of my children and Olivia is 17 now so 17 years ago was when i got my first retail studio and mm. i was doing an in-person sales for i believe it was a newborn session and the client said to me I want to come back and probably do six months or one year. Do you have a package? So like any good photographer, I was like, of course I do. Sure. <laughs> I have a baby plan. And she was like, great. And I was like, I will email you my baby plan. And at the time there was a guy, I can't remember his name. He was selling the $50 baby plan and he sold some kind of philosophy of clients paying $50 and coming back for a year. And I remember mm -hmm. looking up his plan going, there's no way I can afford to do that. Now I have rent. So I sat down and I created a baby plan and I'm going to explain briefly the plan then and what it is now. At the time mm -hmm. I created a baby plan for the milestones. So maternity, mm -hmm. newborn, three months, six months, nine months, one year. And then I gave them a free session when they graduated the plan. So if they started at the maternity, it would be seven sessions, but they pay for six. What I did was I sat down with a piece of paper. Remember, my dad's an accountant and I went to school for accounting. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and wrote down the retail price of each of the sessions. And newborn is a little bit higher. So let's say a maternity, three, six, nine, twelve, they're all hundred dollar sessions. Let's just say and a newborn session is two hundred. So I wrote down the total cost of that and I took 20% off of that. That was then the cost of the plan. Then at the time, I threw in an 8x10, 5x7, two 4x6, and 8 wallets. So the plan, my first plan price, I'll never forget it because I've taught on this, is, was $600 for, I think that there was like three plans, the maternity stage, the newborn stage, and the three-month stage. So one of my plans was $600. And that would give them, I think, five sessions it was, and or four sessions with a fifth one free. 3C out. That was the 36912 plan, and they would get a fifth session free. So they pay the $600 at the time of booking so that then they could just call me at the three month, six month, nine month, one year, we book a session, mm -hmm. and I would just treat it like a mini session. And then when they come in for their ordering, they could choose their eight by eight by ten, five by seven, two, four by sixes, and eight wallets. Well, mm -hmm. in the beginning it was Fabulous. It was a great price point. The economy was doing great. It was 2003, 2004. Everything was doing fine. And 
the clients were loving it because they could come back. I was really good with children, learned really to understand the milestones, educated myself on premature babies. A premature baby isn't doing three months things at three months. Sometimes they're four, five months. So then I started having to make adjustments because then I had clients in the plan having another baby and not being able to come back so quickly. So if it was just a first baby, that was fine because we could do three, six, nine, 12. But here's the thing, 75% of those clients have another baby get pregnant towards the end of that first year, of my clients anyway. And there's a, there's, yeah, no, it's huge. There's a good (laughs) 25% that space it out. But if I were to pull up all my baby plan files, at least 75% had a child, another was pregnant in the plan. So then I started saying, okay, there were a couple things I had to change. Number one, I had to change that price point because I would, I remember coming in on a Saturday doing IPS ordering appointments and no money was happening because what was happening? They were coming in for their eight by 10, five by seven, two, four by sixes and eight wallets. I could upsell them on frames. So I started giving 20% off of any kind of wall portrait or book for a baby planner. So then I started selling baby collages because I would do all their baby parts and their milestones. And so I would sell frames for the one year of collages or sell frames at like the six month stage of the baby parts. I had a baby parts nine opening frame that was like my number one seller. Through this baby plan, I became Excel Picture Frame's biggest customer in all of this side of the country. I'll never forget the day they came and like, did a speech to one of my workshops and they're like, Anna's our biggest customer. I didn't even know it. It was like two years later because I was so obsessed with the baby plan and selling, upselling wall art for my planners that were literally coming every three months and they were getting a frame every single time. Mm. So then I now fast forward to my plan. I have two plans. And they're on my website. Anyone can go to annabrandt.com and look at them. But I changed it towards the number of sessions and not necessarily the milestone. So you can still buy a baby plan at the maternity stage, at the newborn stage, at the three month stage. And each of those baby plans includes number of sessions. So it could be four sessions, mm-hmm. five sessions, six sessions, and we still give a complimentary session. But the difference is now we don't attribute it to a milestone. You can call us whenever you want. And we say that you have up to five years to do the plan, but you can even go longer. Meaning if you want to do newborn six months, one year, 18 months, two year, no problem. On your account, you're going to have, you're still paying for the entire baby plan at the beginning. And then on your account, we see your profile. She's a baby planner. She has six sessions on her account. And every time she comes in for a session, it's noted. At Christmas time, they can have three sessions if they want. Because many times at Christmas time, they'll go, can I come in for the one year? And then can I come back and do a family session? Absolutely. Because every time that client's in front of my camera, they get a discount on holiday cards, on books, on wall portraits, on jewelry. And we can build their wall collections, their gallery. And Every single one of my planners is on with the next baby. This, the mom that I said is missing the baby book. She's been on my baby plan for kids. The plan, we just keep changing the plan. So much so that I have mm-hmm. one client that didn't even pay for the second plan because she had three babies back to back and had bought two plans. And she had an ordering appointment mm-hmm. at Christmas. And my assistant went to write up everything and realized we hadn't taken a, a session fee from her in a long time. And the client was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she had placed a $4,000 order. And she's like, I don't even think I played for the other plan because I had another baby. And she was so sweet. She's like, let me just buy another plan. And so we were able to do a $4,000 order with prints and wall collections and everything and still have her purchase another plan. So it's developing a relationship I, you can say I'm going to start it out with one kid, but I'm telling you 90% of the time they're going to have another child in your plan and you just have to find ways to adjust and have incentives. Okay, so these baby plans are really wonderful ideas that kind of lock the people in, I guess you can say. Again, I don't like to talk about people like that, but that's kind of what they do because, of course, once they put the money down, it's non-refundable. 
and you tend to see that they go through the plan anyway. I want to ask you though too, these people, do you find that your clients that sign up for the plan, do they go on to buy other, say like mini sessions or other photography packages from you? Yes, absolutely. We do a lot of different mini sessions throughout the year and our mini sessions are always discounted and have different product included in them and they're very enticing. And so our clients uh, love to be part of our mini sessions. And I'd say a good 20% of our mini sessions, if not more during the holidays, are baby planners. Cause they're, th now we've established a relationship, they're used to coming mm -hmm. and if we're doing a mini session, especially something holiday driven, they really wanna be a part of it. And it's going to be less expensive than one of their, their package sessions. Okay, so there again, the kind of the baby plan can set up a gift that just keeps on giving for all any of those maternity and newborn photographers looking for something to do to spice up their their business um you know if we're on the topic of mini sessions uh are there some um some kind of mini sessions that you find to be very popular for the maternity and the newborn uh industry yes oh my goodness well we've been doing santa for 14 years i believe the same santa He's amazing, mm. and I have clients that have had pictures with him all 14 years. So Santa mm. is extremely popular, and mm. we only allow Santa for our existing clients because oh. a man in a red suit can be scary. And if we don't know the child, we don't know how the child will behave with this strange man in a red suit. So. Mm. Santa is the only one that we have that is for existing clients only. And it's funny because around the fall, word will get out that it's only for existing clients. Every year, people will book other mini sessions or other regular sessions to get a session with me to get in on Santa. <laughs> and every year. That's we brilliant. Have, yeah. Every year That's we have new brilliant. clients. They'll be like, I'm coming for a session in October. Santa's in November. I can come, right? <laughs> I'll be like, yeah. Um, brilliant Is that going to count? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's awesome. yeah because, well, because there was a year where I didn't do that and kids were like running out of my studio, like crying because they were afraid of Santa. Yeah. And then they'd yeah. come in for a session later, like peeking, like, is Santa in there? And it's like July. And I'm like, oh my gosh, mm. I need to have a relationship with this child so that they're not so afraid of Santa. Um, but one of the things that's super popular, we've done it four years now, and we'll do it again this year, is the tree farm. Going to an actual live Christmas tree farm, Last year we sold out, we did I think four or five, I don't even remember how many days we did. I practically lived at this tree farm. I was joking to the owner that I was just gonna get an RV and move in for the week because literally we were shooting nonstop at the tree farm. I mean, originally I was even gonna just shoot like uh, like two hours before sunset and we had to start shooting at noon. We were booked so much and you, it looked like a movie set. Alex and I and our staff got really good at building, oh my gosh, diffusers and, and we're, I'm already planning for this year that it's going to literally be like a movie set, like six foot diffusers because we're having to start at midday and block the sun at a tree mm -hmm. farm. But the tree farm is super popular everybody wants to do it people missed out last year because we were sold out and literally are asking when we're going to open every year i do christmas in july and we pre-sell sessions for the fall season in july we also release our best beach specials of the year in july and we can easily bring in twenty to thirty thousand dollars in pre-sales of summer and fall sessions in July and this year because of what's going on we're actually talking about releasing them at the end of April early May because mm -hmm. um, people are home and they know their schedules and they're trying to plan accordingly so we'll be releasing specials even earlier um, mm -hmm. but yeah there, there's so many ideas you can do with mini sessions I mean people do cake smashes for the one year and so for the baby plan you can include that for the baby planners or keep it separate definitely over the holidays find fun locations you know spring we're kind of missing out on spring now but we do beach summer specials find good mm -hmm. locations every year i try to find a new location and clients will even ask me did you find a new location this year because i'll try to find a place that i've never been to before so now's a great time to get in your car you don't even have to leave just kind of scout at sunrise or sunset or whatever and mm -hmm. so 
there's there has been seven consecutive years where I would introduce a new location. And then existing clients would be like, great, we never did that location before. Great, we never did that. So much so that a client will call me and go, did you discover any new locations? And when we had a, a rain, really crazy rain here a couple of years ago, then it was last year we had tons of foliage and blooms. And we literally went in the mountains and were photographing these flowers that we had never done before. So there, yeah. and we just did, you know, these mini sessions and there's so many different things that you can do. If you have cherry blossoms, if you have, you know, especially when you get a lot of weather and there's a particular area that's greener this year, we'll then do mini sessions. Or if you found a forest, do forest sessions. People love to get out. Um, and there are photographers that literally all they do are mini sessions. You can do themed sessions and superhero. And there's so many different ideas that you can do now um, and give people a reason to come out. Yes, and give a reason, yes, for them to contact you. That's, you know, I was thinking that too, just how wonderful these are from a marketing perspective, like not only from the photography business and just the actual selling of the product and making the money, but also the marketing perspective. Like you say, people calling you just to see if you found a new location yet this year. Yeah. And the fact that you said about the Santa, that you have to come to something before you can come to the Santa, and that prompts people to come to a session in addition to the Santa. And you know, the selling out of the park. So people are trying to book and make sure, you know, you know, rearrange their plans to make sure they can make it this time. Yeah. It's just, it's wonderful. It, it's really just wonderful from a marketing perspective too. So mini sessions, they're really like, almost like, a, you know, they're very important because they can bring you good money and they can also set up a wonderful marketing platform oh, for, yeah. for business. So like. Everybody likes something new and something different. They love it. They make, mm. make your own sets. We've made our own sets. Oh my goodness, we've made so many sets, floral sets, spring sets. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. And the mm -hmm. more creative you are, and the minute you open up your, your, the, I think the minute you open up that part of your brain, it is like a floodgate, literally. Mm -hmm. My staff knows the minute I get one idea, my eyes get really big and they're like, oh no, 50 more ideas are gonna come. Because yeah. you just kind of have to, kind of open that door and then just right. it's like Pandora's box and all of a sudden you're like oh I can do this and this and then your clients will feed off of ideas they'll be like what are you going to do next year and and they'll go oh I've always been wanting to do a session in a trail in a forest um on the beach or oh I've always wanted to do this and and you're like oh you know even like the superhero things you know I I'm not a big superhero fan but one of my vendors had sent me this little Superman costume and I used it. My clients were like, oh my gosh, I love this. Do you have other superheroes? And I'm like, oh my gosh, now the pressure is on. And I, I'm like, <laughs> I even thinking the other day, like I need to buy a new super, do I buy Wonder Woman? Like, like, so then I, so now I'm telling my clients, if you want a superhero, ask me in advance, cause I don't have a whole superhero closet, but I know f mm. photographers that do, they have a whole, like mm. every superhero known to man. And then they become, they become the specialist in these superhero mini newborn sessions and people will will drive seven hours to these things, you know? Okay. It's kind of like specialty Superhero. birthday parties too. I, I would, I went to LA and did an American Girl doll birthday party for my daughter because it was a specialty. Is that something I would do mm. every year? No. Was it expensive? Mm. Absolutely. But it was such an amazing experience. My daughter loved it. And so it's like these mini sessions can be amazing experiences that are they going to want to do the same mm. one every year? No. That's why you need to come up with new ideas and different ones every year so that you draw them back in. Yeah, but staying creative, like you say, and, and the photographers, whenever they find some downtime, if maybe they don't have a lot of clients or business coming in, you know, that's the time when you can try and slow down and get creative. I know sometimes when I'm like stressed and busy, that seems to, you know, stop my creativity. So if you kind of have a moment when you're, you don't have much else, else to do, sorry, maybe really use that to your advantage and really slow down and try and have this like these creative moments come to you. Uh, as Anna says, get in the car, drive around, try and find a nice location for, for a shot, shoot, or something yeah. like that. That's, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, I want to jump back, uh, Anna Brand, to the print products. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have found us at Enphoto. We're yes. very thankful for that behind 
me, our viewers can see all of your products, some of, some of the many products that you have printed through our, our company. And I wanna know what it is about us at Enphoto that had you check us out and what has made you uh, stick around with us. Yes, and I'm redoing all of my product guides right now. That's one of the things on my to-do list during this break. Um, but the quality, I think, is beautiful. I love the the touches and the finishes and the the mixture of the the different surfaces of the books and the products and it just the the sheer beauty of them. I'm drawn to product. I'm drawn to good, strong product that's going to look good in many different homes. I have a very wide clientele. I have celebrities mm. where money is no object, have everything they need. And then I have people on very, very tight budgets. And that's super important to me. I want everyone to be able to have beautiful products that are affordable, regardless of what level of income or notoriety you are. And I think that Enfoto has a great product line for that and the prices are fabulous. And one of the things I've been working with you on is coming up with different packages. I had expressed to you before that I wanted like, you know, superior package, you know, more of an elite package and then an everyday package. And I think that there's enough um, variations in your product line to be able to do that and be able to support various clientele because you never know really who's walking through your door. I think we've all mm. learned that you can't really judge how someone is dressed or what car they're driving. Um, you really can't judge that anymore, especially in Southern California. People walk around in shorts and flip flops. You can't really say, mm. oh, this person is wealthy, this person isn't. So you've got to, it's kind of better that way. You've got to treat all your clients like with that kind of celebrity, you know, specialty um, service. You want all your clients to feel like that they can have good products and you don't want them to feel like one product is cheaper than the other just because of what their budget is. Right, yeah, that is very important. Is there, and it's, it's, it's gonna be hard for you to say, I feel like I already know what you're gonna say, but because you have such a diverse clientele, but what is, a product or one or two products that you find to be something that your clients always seem to be drawn to or that sells really well for you? Gosh, I, I, it's, I'm torn between canvas and books. Mm -hmm. I'm torn between those two because I think books has always been higher for me than canvases and wall art. Gosh, mm -hmm. it really depends. My longtime clients like wall art because that's kind of how we started but mm. i'm a pretty big bookseller because i believe in books because i love books and i love okay. the passing of the book um but i'm a big believer and that's including albums that's yes. mainly what you're talking about yes albums, okay. albums. yeah albums i should say not to be confused with photo books which no albums yeah yeah I, albums and wall art they're right there okay do you offer any kind of digital options to your clients or are you strictly print products? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have, I have two types of session fees, only two. One is the session only. It's my time and talent. And I love when people go, what does that include? I'm like me, myself and I. <laughs> <laughs> I love when people ask me that. They're like, and I get what? You get me. And what else? <laughs> Still me. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to have fun with people on the phone because they'll be like, does that include everything? I'm like, yeah, all of me and then some. Um, so I have a session fee. <laughs> Alex is laughing too. You can have fun with it. They're asking. They're like, that $200, that $300, still me. So a session fee and it's on my website and I still have to explain it just like everybody else, time and talent of the photographer. Everything else is a la carte. And then there's a mm. digital package. The digital package includes my time and talent and includes a certain number of images and includes physical product as well as 20% off anything additional. So I do not believe in the Dropbox photographer completely against it. If you are one, just don't tell me you're one. And I mentor a lot of photographers, so I know who you are. Because I had a client come to me one time and she's like, I spent $2,000 on my boudoir package and I don't do boudoir. But she said she went to this highly regarded photographer in LA, spent all this money on boudoir, had the best session ever, did hair and makeup six hours later. And then the photographer is like, oh, by the way, when you come in and get your digital images, go pick up a flash drive from Office Max. 
And I was like, wait, are you joking? Please tell me this is a joke. And the client's like, no, I didn't even, I don't even, I didn't even know what flash drive to buy. I had to go to Office Max and ask a technician and call the photography studio. And she didn't even know how much space is on a flash drive. And then other people tell me, oh yeah, I went to this photographer and she just dropboxed me all my images and then the link expired and I can't find them. And then my hard drive blew up, my computer broke, my kid knocked my laptop off. I don't even know where the images are. And I'm just like, whoa, I will not sell any digital package without product. And if you're my client, you know this because people will call and go, can I skip the product and get a cheaper digital package? The answer is no. It's just that simple. So in every digital package, I include a USB, a physical USB in a physical USB cover with their image on it, a physical image box with their image on the box with printed four by six prints inside and mini books with their images. So they get this physical package with images that they've chosen. If they want to enlarge anything, they get 20% off. They can buy prints, calendars, canvases, books. They get their 20% off everything. They know that. I'm working on many client orders. People think that because I sell digital that I don't sell anything else. Absolutely not true. Some of my best digital customers spend thousands of dollars afterwards. They come to me repeatedly. They love having the digital reference, but like the example I used before of my client that bought digital packages, she doesn't even know where her digital images are and she still wants to me to come for books. So in every digital package, they have to have printed product. And actually in our new packages that we're working on, we have a book, an album that's included for our baby planners at the one year they get a physical album with 40 images, but our new digital package packages this spring and summer will have digital packages for the non-baby planner that will include albums and wall art as well. They can build their own mm. packages and things like that. So I believe so much so in the physical product that I will not do a digital session without it. Even my mini sessions get a physical USB tin. It's a smaller version of what our regular sessions do. They still get a physical representation and they will call me and say, because at Christmas we'll go, I'll drop box you a couple images for your Christmas card. If you want to do your own Christmas cards, I can rush you images, send a wheat transfer. But they know their order is not complete until they receive something physical from me. Mm. Okay. So always have something physical when representing the digital. And um, we offer many options at Mphoto that can combine digital and print together in a very convenient way. Uh, so if that's something that you're looking to do, uh, feel free to browse around our complete sets. There are wonderful ways for you to combine a physical product like Anna suggests with a digital option. And at the very least, a digital, a physical digital USB. We can do those even separately as well. Um, so always be sure, as Anna says, to provide something physical preferably a print product as well as a digital uh, medium. Um, okay, so yeah, and people tend, like you said, people tend to want the, the, the printed product, even if they think they just want the digital. Once they go through it, once they hear a little bit from you, they understand that, yeah, actually what I want is the printed product. Um, and can no, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, when they call the book, if they're a new client and they'll go, well, do I have to have all of that digital product? I just want the images. And I, I say, yes, you, it's included. I'm not going to discount and remove that. Can I tell you, you know, they pay a, a deposit to book a session and then at the session they pay the full thing. So when they go to, to pick their items for their digital, it's all been paid for. When they mm. receive it, they've completely forgotten about the conversation not wanting to that because it's such it's so beautiful they're like oh my gosh i like they love it it's on their coffee table it's display they're spending good money my minimum package is a minimum of thousand dollars for this so mm. if you're just sending images in the air and they've sent a thousand dollars they're going to sit there and go well, where did my thousand dollars go by by providing a tangible something they they feel satisfied. They feel like they got they have something, you know. They have something yeah. in their hand. 
Yeah, and very generally speaking, as much as we might not want to admit it, the bigger that something is, the more value they feel for it. You know, like generally that that's yeah. how it works. Yeah. Uh, but we're on we're on the topic of clients, and I want to ask you because you do have such a diverse clientele,、mm-hmm. and I find that very fascinating because sometimes you hear photographers who are very you know focused and very selective、mm. of saying, and even kind of maybe saying to other photographers like, look, just like find that that niche and just hit it out of the park. Whereas you. Seem you're kind of welcoming, like the whole. In some ways, you're kind of welcoming a wide range. So, kind of, what is it that you do to make sure? Because nobody wants to have those nightmare clients. Nobody wants to have those clients that are just causing them problems. Like, you kind of address it there. Do you just kind of fix those clients in the process, or, or how do you kind of avoid getting some clients that are really just not going to work well with you? Oh, I've had them. Trust me, I've had them.、Mm-hmm. I've had them. Not every client is for every photographer, and not every photographer is for every client. And there have been some clients where I'm like, "Good luck on your journey finding a photographer.、Mm. I'm sorry, I'm not the <laughs> one for you." <laughs>、um, oh, wow. yeah. I don't want every client.、Um, you know, there's always going to be people that say you're too expensive. Always, It,、mm. I've been doing this 20 years. It doesn't matter what price point you have; they're going to be like, "Ooh, that's out of my budget." I go, "No problem." It's you have to have your price point and your products that you are comfortable with, that you can back up. Only carry products that you actually like and would use. Be selective in your offerings and make sure that your pricing and your packages reflect. Your cost of doing business—it's not like we're just、mm. pulling these numbers out of the air. I've got rent and payroll and insurance and all of these things to pay. So, when a client says, "Can you do better on that price?"、Um, I say, "You know, I no, this is my price. I mean, I I、mm. I can say now I'm a photographer for 20 years, but honestly, even when I first started, I would get the same thing, and they and I would say, 'No, this is my price.' But then I would also say, 'Sign up for my newsletter. I have specials all year round. I have mini sessions.'" I have gift certificates. I have twenty percent off. I mean, I do specials all year round. I would love for you to sign up for my newsletter and maybe one of these specials, and maybe a mini session. Maybe you only come for a mini session every year. Like if you truly like my work and want to work with me, I have an affordable option for everybody. But、mm. if If even my mini sessions aren't affordable to you or aren't something that you're comfortable doing, then that's fine. There's tons of photographers in California. I don't, I don't need to service every single client. I can't service every single client. I'm only one person, and I feel like、yeah. there's enough business for everybody that you don't need to sell your soul on the street. You need to be confident in your pricing, confident in your offerings, and start creating a service and build your name. And regardless of how long you build your name, regardless. Of whether you've been around six months or twenty years, there will always be people that don't want to pay your pricing, or want to get something for nothing, or want to take advantage of the situation, or maybe your personalities don't match, or maybe you can't get their child to relax. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. I mean, and myself included. There has been, you know, we we joke about my daughters and I. We go to so many different nail salons, and there have been some nail salons that we've gone into. We'll be like, we will never go there again because our fingers are bleeding, or we felt like the person didn't pay attention to us, or they were super expensive. And and then we'll go. Well, we've literally probably been to thirty nail salons. You can ask my teenage daughters, and they will tell you which nail salons have the best service, which one were a little pricier, were worth it, which one made their nails bleed, which one felt that they didn't feel like they were listening to my daughters. And these are fifteen and seventeen year old kids. And there are some nail salons where we like we'll look at each other and be like we'll never go there again. And then there are others. That we love so much that we can't wait to go in because they see us, they say hi, they treat us extra special, they give us water, we can trust them, and and so you you've got to tell yourself as a business owner and as a photographer, I don't need every client, I can't service every client. It doesn't matter what pricing I come with; it's not going to be for everybody. Not. 
it's fine dining and fast food and and it's it's mm. you need different things at different time there are times where you have five mm. kids in the car and you need fast food you need to drive through mcdonald's get mcdonald burgers feed everybody and get everyone home for a nap and then there's times where you have an anniversary and you want a quiet dinner with your husband and you want a customized menu and you want a gluten-free menu and you want someone to wait on you does that mean you go there every day no. And does that mean you go to McDonald's every day? No. It's the same thing. I'm not fast food. Do I have mini sessions? Sure. Are they great? Absolutely. But there are times where you're going to want fine dining and, and there's got to be a happy balance for both. As the photographer, are you only fine dining or do you have fast food options at different times of the year? Or are you only mm -hmm. fast food? And whatever you are, be comfortable with what your business model is and don't apologize for it. And that's the main message I'm getting is to look at it from the inside out and not from the outside in. So yes. if you focus on your business and if you create your business in a fun, uh, strong way, I'm losing the word, uh, to be able to appropriately and safely and financially feasibly address these different markets, then okay, then they will come and so on and so forth. But don't try to chase a specific cohort or try to chase everybody, yeah. but look at it from the inside out, not the, not the outside in. I think that's a very interesting perspective and I really appreciate that. Okay, Anna, now you have been in the industry for over 20 years, the maternity and newborn industry that is, and you are the preeminent figure uh, today for the maternity and newborn industry all around the world. So I have to ask you this next question, and that is how have you seen the industry kind of change over the last 20 years? And where do you see it kind of heading? Where do you think it's gonna head and be in the next five, 10 years time? Well, when, when it started, it was very basic. It was more fine art maternity, more mm. black and white, more nude, uh, more working mm. with fabrics uh, because there really wasn't anything available. So maternity was more, just more in the kind of fine art realm. Then over the years, um, with all of the maternity gowns. I remember I started designing maternity gowns 15 years ago. Nobody was selling maternity gowns to photographers as kind of a prop. It wasn't anything. And it became pretty, it's pretty big business buying maternity gowns. You can spend anywhere from 100 to $600. I've seen even higher on maternity gowns. So the, the, now the, the gowns, the wardrobe, the hair and the makeup is very similar to an engagement photo shoot. It's very much more mainstream now. I think where, where it's going is kind of a mixture of both. Definitely destination maternity and location maternity is becoming more and more recognized and more grand. Um, a lot of uh, photographers, myself included, like to find new locations, get out of, there's two kinds of things. There's location photography there because of the baby moon industry. Um, a lot of vendors, and it'll be interesting to see with the travel market, how that happens. But the past couple of years, there's definitely an, an, a rise in baby moons. And so, couples were going on mini holidays, vacations, during the last trimester and then getting mm -hmm. photos done. So for a mm -hmm. lot of uh, maternity photographers, finding locations that are more grand, beautiful buildings, uh, beautiful locations, gorgeous hills, and taking the, you can't just show up to a maternity session. You've got to have gowns in hand. So if you're a maternity photographer, you should have a pretty good maternity closet. I have about 400 gowns in my closet and anyone who specials in maternity, if they're doing it for a long time, they probably have a maternity closet worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Being able to provide a full service, we use a hair and makeup stylist, is gonna be very, very important. Having that full service package, including hair and makeup, including the gowns. My clients can just show up literally with their underwear in a bag and we can provide everything for them. Back in the day when I started, they would have to bring their own shirts or sweaters or I would try to find fabric resin or, you know, remnants for them to use or they would go bare. Now, now having the gowns, having a stylist, having everything taken care of is super important. I just had a client email me the other day saying, 
she wanted to get a session and she has nothing. She's like, I need hair and makeup and I need gowns and I need backdrops. I, I don't have anything. And I'm like, well, you don't have to have anything. You can just show up and I can take care of everything for you. So if you're mm-hmm. going to do maternity, I think that that service aspect to stay ahead of your competition and investing in gowns, investing in fabrics, investing in good fans and investing in more fine art backdrops. Uh, Becky from Intuition Backgrounds has increased her background line to be bigger for maternity, um, you know, to kind of bring back some of that fine art that we had kind of about 10 years ago with more canvas and fine art backdrops that kind of got lost in the way. A lot of that is coming back now. So I think maternity is going to be regarded as more of a formal portrait experience with understanding that you can do, you can still do nude and you can still do milk baths. But I think that the maternity photographer needs to be prepared to have a nice wide portfolio uh, because mm. the maternity woman is, is every woman that comes in is so different. One wants tossing fabric, another one wants nude, another one wants formal gowns, another one wants only backlighting, another one wants location. The maternity woman is modern and she is paying attention to the Pinterest boards. She is decorating her nursery. She is very aware of her body. She is eating healthy. She's not afraid to show her belly. She's going to invest a lot of money in maternity if her photographer is prepared. So you definitely have to be prepared. Okay. And you see kind of traveling being kind of the next area to be mixed in with maternity, kind of the, like you say, on location or destination maternity yeah. shoots. Yeah, for Okay. Sure. Well, so there you have it, our audience, some nice things to uh, keep your mind going of what you can be offering to your own clients to help yourself stand out and really solidify your, your own brand and style. And in general, Anna Brent, you see the uh, maternity and newborn industry just kind of growing and staying stable over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. I know that people are worried with the iPhones and everyone being able to capture their own images and obviously with the health concern. I think at the end of the day, moms want beautiful photos of their newborns. The photographers need to stay with the trends, stay relevant, pay attention to the the what's happening and you know, always freshen up their props and their style and make sure that they're not outdated um, and always make sure that they can provide the best lighting and setups. But I think at the end of the day, uh, there are uh, still a good amount of people that aren't interested in taking their own newborn photos and want to be in the photos themselves and want a good experience. And I don't think it's going anywhere. I know over the years when digital came, people thought that was the end of portrait photography. They thought that was the end of child photography, that now that everybody, all consumers could buy their own digital cameras, that nobody was going to want to go to a studio for child photography. And that hasn't happened. Child photography is bigger than ever. There's gorgeous fine art Mm -hmm. photography out there. There's... uh, I, we haven't slowed down in, in our child photography. I think that there will always be something for everybody. It's it's the same with DIY. You know, when, when the DIY shows came with how to remodel your kitchen and how to flip your own home, everybody thought that's going to be the end. There's going to be no reason for interior design and there's going to be no reason for for you know anyone needing anybody to to paint a room and and no that's that's not it we still we want to learn how to cook our own meals but we still want to go to restaurants you know we we want to learn how to remodel our own bathroom but at the end of the day we're probably still going to have to hire a contractor to do it it's a very small percentage <laughs> of the world that wants to do everything themselves there is a very very large percentage you have to look at what percentage controls the wealth the number has changed over the mm. years i remember when i started it said 3% of the the population controls 97% of the wealth. The other day I looked up a a statistic and I think it's down to 1.5%, you know? And so it's like, you have to understand who controls the wealth in this country and who Mm -hmm. your client is. And there are still a good amount of people that control the wealth that still want to pay for a good service. Right. A comparison that I like to make is comparing like photography with theater you know their cinema has been around forever and it's only getting crazier and more advanced yet the theater is still thriving people People still still love to go to the show the live audience the live show 
something about that experience, something about the quality. Even the best actors often aspire to doing some theater work as yeah. well. I see professional photography in a similar light. Like you say, even with digital cameras, iPhones, and all that stuff, nothing is ever going to replace professional photography. And like you say, what is more important than newborn photos, maternity photos? It's hard to find something more important than that. Anna, you have given us so much wonderful advice today, but I just want to ask you one last time before we go, if there's one piece of advice you'd like to give to a photographer that you believe is important or that they maybe have not heard before. You know, I don't know if I can say anything that people haven't heard before, but I can say that my advice is consistency is the key to success. And I don't think that's anything new. I think we forget consistency with anything is going to give you success. That doesn't mean you're not going to fail along the way, but picking yourself back up. I, I say all the time, what do we tell our children when they fall or when something doesn't work or when they have a bad day? We tell them to get back up, to try again tomorrow. Tomorrow will be better. If it's broke, fix it. If you failed, let's try again. If that didn't work, let's try something else. We don't say, oh, give up or <laughs> You might as well just call it a day, you're eight. No, we're constantly motivating the generations below us. And we quite often don't put the mirror on ourselves. And this is what I tell photographers. What would be your advice to somebody younger than you, to a child, to somebody you who went to you and was struggling, whether it's financially or health-wise or creativity or on a creativity level or sales or whatever, fill in the blank. I struggle with what? Now, flip it. And I have to use children because people can easily relate. And your child comes to you and, and let's use your example with your child. And because when you're a child, your world is, you really think that it's so limited. Like you don't understand because you're a child. You, you only have limited depth right in your knowledge so children depend on people that are wiser and stronger than them to say hey it's gonna get better this too shall pass let's try again let me tell you about my failures anyone that is considered successful of any genre i don't care if you're an author an actor someone who sells homes or anyone who has any measure of success will tell you that consistency is the key. You're going to fail. You, you will. I will. You will. There's no doubt about that. We're human beings. We're not perfect. It's what are you going to do with that failure? What are you going to do with those mistakes? You've got to get back up. And, and we're, we're all imperfect human beings. And if we can just stay consistent, consistent in our purpose, our mission, our reason, our drive, our motivation, not give up, understand that we need motivation, we need support of others, we need to be loved, we need to be recognized, we need to know that we matter, and get just pick yourself back up every single day and say that tomorrow I'm gonna be a little bit better than yesterday. Fantastic. On that note, Anna, we are going to wrap up the interview for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and provide some invaluable content for our listeners. Once again, we will have all of her links below in the description so you can find ways to stay connected with Anna Brand, follow her, and get even more awesome insight and valuable advice. Thank you so much, Anna, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to do it, folks. I'm Eugene Negovietsky with Anna Brandt coming to us from L.A., California. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel and other social media channels because we will have plenty of content coming your way. Until next time, take care.